Well, good morning. It's good to be with all of you at Gospel of Grace. It's an honor to be preaching to you here this morning. Now, dear ones, we're going to be doing a message today that's been on my mind for some time because of the recent events. And I know many of you that are listening and watching this perhaps have been greatly impacted by the rioting, etc. But I also know a few of you have been impacted by racism in your life. I've actually talked to you. And I want you to know that the hatred that's been expressed towards you because of your race is not just hatred against you. Ultimately, it's a hatred of God who makes all people in his image. And so today I'm going to be really addressing the question of racism, showing why it is evil biblically, but I'm also going to address the evil of people falsely accusing others of being racist. We're going to be looking at both evils. And so I want to begin this morning by looking at the definition of racism. Now, this is a definition that I've come up with myself, so you may want to take issue with it, but I think it's accurate. To me, racism is simply hating or mistreating someone either solely or partly based on some physical ethnic trait. Now, what I'm going to show you today in this message is that biblically, racism is really a hatred towards God because it's complaining about something that God has made, saying, saying somehow that he's created a human being deficiently. So it's really a complaint about God. Now, sadly today, though, I also want to address this false definition of racism that the left in America is coming up with, and that is that anyone born white is automatically a racist. Now, I know some of you are confused to say, well, I've never heard that definition. Well, that's the new definition in America, according to the left. If you're white, you're automatically a racist. And what this ultimately comes from is something called critical race theory. And critical race theory is something that really comes from Marxists. But let me explain what Marx taught and explain why they hold to this view. Remember, Karl Marx was a German philosopher. He was a student of Hegel. And to boil down Marx's religion, and oh yes, it is a religion, what Marx taught was that there was going to be a utopia, a kingdom on earth created by man as a result of a battle between the thesis what he called capitalism, with the battle with antithesis, which was socialism, which would one day lead to communism, which would be the great synthesis and the great kingdom. But the only way this would come about is remember Marx broke people down into haves, which are evil, and according to Marx, the bourgeoisie, versus the have-nots, the proletariat, the working class. And what Marx wanted was that the working class had to rise up against the haves in order to bring this kingdom about. And so at the end of the Communist Manifesto that Marx wrote with Engels, he says, workers of the world, actually literally it's the proletariat of the world, rise up and unite, for all you have to lose are your shackles. Now, the reason that's important is because one of the big problems with Marxism, as Marxists tried to implement this false religion, was that a lot of people didn't really find their identity in being a worker, part of the proletariat, but they found their identity in their nationality. For example, someone identifies as being a German or being an American, or even more importantly, people would identify with their religion, being like a Christian, for example. And so what happened is when the Marxists came from the Fabian Socialists in the 1920s to America, they found out a bunch of these workers did not find any identity in being part of the proletariat that would rise up and throw off the bourgeoisie. And so in order to create divisions and to make sure that you had haves versus have-nots in society, that would people would break down according to those lines, they artificially manufactured it by breaking people down according to race, class, gender. I call that the unholy trinity of Marxism in America. So again, break people down according to the haves and have-nots, notice on the screen, in race, class, and gender. And so Amer in America, the left gets to define who are the haves and the have-nots. And so when it comes to race, they define white people as the haves and everyone else as part of the have-nots. Okay, when it comes to class, Marx has always taught about class warfare, again, between the, the haves and the have-nots, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat. But what's interesting is who defines how much money you can have before you enter into the have class versus the have not class. Well, the left determines that. 
and it's a moving target. So for example, in the 20th century, Stalin actually defined a bourgeoisie, someone who was a have, as far as the Ukrainians were concerned, anyone who had more than two cattle was part of the bourgeoisie. So if you were a Ukrainian farmer and you had more than two cattle, he murdered you. Stalin murdered millions of Ukrainians in a, in a purge called the dekulikization of the Ukraine. And that's why there's a lot of animosity even to this day between Russians and Ukrainians. Now, in America, it's the left who defines how wealthy you can be. And again, that's a moving target. Uh, Bernie Sanders, before he was a millionaire, thought millionaires were part of the haves. Then he became a millionaire, and all of a sudden it was the billionaires who were the bourgeoisie. So it is changing. But notice also they try to break people into haves and have-nots regarding gender. And when it comes to gender, of course, the males are the haves, and the females are the have-nots. That's traditional. But as the Marxist left moves further away from the biblical ethos, now you have more genders. You have homosexuals and transgenders, et cetera. So all I can tell you is that males are the have gender and everyone else is part of the have nots. And so in America, the left is defined race, class, and gender this way. If you're white, if you're wealthy, and you're male, you're the most hated. You are evil by your very existence and you have to be overthrown. Okay, and again, all of this is part of what they call critical race theory, but it was designed to get rid of national identity and get rid of religious identity so people would identify as the haves or the have nots. They had to force the Hegelian dialectic or the Marxist dialectic. Okay, now we'll come back to that, but what I want to do is talk about racism as an evil. It really is an attack against God. Now, let me show you why. Notice here what Moses said in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. He said, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, dear ones, I want you to notice here that yes, God creates man in this passage, and this is what gives inherent worth to human beings. Having human worth as an image bearer of God isn't something we earn as human beings, but it is intrinsic to who we are as human beings made in the image of God because of God's creative work. And the importance of our being image bearers isn't just found here in Genesis 1, but all the way through Genesis. In fact, when you get to Genesis chapter 9, we see that God institutes government for the specific purpose of restraining evil so that men and women made in the image of God will be protected. Now, before Genesis chapter 9, before the flood, God used to intervene directly in the affairs of men. In fact, you'll see this in Genesis 4, where remember when Cain murdered Abel, remember God intervened with Cain and he punished him. But after the flood, God withdraws his direct management, as it were and he uses human government. And so in Genesis 9, 6, God says, if a man sheds a man's blood, so by man shall his blood be shed. That's the institution of capital punishment. That's the institution of human government. So human government traditionally has been understood as by Christians as something that is to restrain evil for the protection of men and women made in the image of God. And by the way, it would extend to the unborn, it would extend to the aged, anyone who is an image bearer of God. Now, sadly, as the country becomes more left-wing, the role of government is no longer designed to restrain evil, but redistribute wealth, okay? And in fact, that's why we see today the left is wanting to get rid of what? The police. They want to defund it. Because after all, if you take from the haves and you give to the have-nots, you're one day going to reach a utopia or no longer will you need police anyway. That's their logic, okay? Now, this is a huge biblical worldview, this idea, notice in verse 27, that God creates man. In fact, notice the term man there in the box. It's literally Adam. It's the term for Adam, but the way I would render it is mankind. And so I want you to see that here, mankind is really what? Notice in verse 27, it's male and female, okay? So God creates men and women in his image, and therefore they have intrinsic value. 
But what you have to realize is that if human beings are merely the byproduct of a cosmic accident, then we have no worth. We have no value. And so this is a huge worldview issue. In fact, the Nazis realized this when they were trying to wipe out every Jew in Europe. They realized the only way that they could get Germans to go along with that is that if they had a worldview that believed that human beings were merely cosmic accidents. And so that's why you see, for example, in 1942, the chief German textbook in ecology and in biology had to do with racism. That's what it was about. In fact, there was a man who wrote it named Jacob Groff that had a whole chapter entitled Evolution and its Importance for Worldview. See, the Nazis realized that if men and women in Europe or in Germany believed that God created all men and women in his image, they couldn't murder the Jews. And so do you see then part and parcel to any healthy worldview is the belief that God creates all things, including men and women in his image. There's an old saying that says, belief in God as creator sails the human fleet in one direction, but denying that God is creator sails the human fleet in quite another. Now, what I want you to do is turn your Bibles, if you will, to the New Testament, because I want you to see that God doesn't care ultimately about a per person's ethnicity. That does not impress him at all, where we came from, uh, what we look like. That doesn't concern God. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 35. Again, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 35. Now, as you're turning there, remember this is where Peter was preaching to Gentiles and they come to faith. And so notice what Peter says, Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 35. Peter says, opening his mouth, he said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, Literally, he's no respecter of persons. He says in verse 35, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. So notice, according to Peter, God doesn't care one bit about our ethnicity. It doesn't impress God. What impresses God is Jesus Christ, his son. And the only way anyone can be spared from the future wrath to come and be part of a glorious coming kingdom is by faith in the son. And so we see later in Acts chapter 17 that God made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind. And in fact, he fixed borders and the times of their inhabitation. Okay, so here's what I want you to think about. In Acts 17, 26, God creates borders. Why? To have multiple governments to protect human beings made in the image of God. Because absolute power corrupts absolutely. God didn't want to have one government. So this is another issue where the left is radically departing from the biblical doctrines because the left wants to have one government. In fact, Hillary Clinton said as much in 2016. But according to Deuteronomy 32, according to Acts 17, 26, God ordains borders for the good of human beings made in his image. Now, let me show you God's response to the critical race theory of the left. Yes, God has a critical race theory as well, he talks about race, class, and gender, but he says something opposite of what the left is saying today. Turn your Bibles to Galatians 3.28. Please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. And what I want you to see is that God sees race, class, gender completely differently than the left today. And what I would say is that people should look at God's word as the model and not any other man. Galatians 3.28, again, the Apostle Paul, personal spokesman for Jesus Christ, who speaks the very words of God. Listen to what he says. He says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, which really is Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is God's critical race theory. And notice what God is saying is that your race isn't critical. <laughs> That's the point. Notice he says there's neither Jew nor Greek. In other words, there's no Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter. Now, remember in Paul's day, those were the only major races. Oh, yes, there were lots of ethnicities. But at the end of the day, only two races in the sense that there were Jews who were the covenant people of God. They were the only nation, the people of Israel, that ever had a theocracy that God chose from all the other nations. And everyone outside of Israel was part of the goyim, the nations, or the Gentiles. 
So you're either Jew or you're Gentile. And it's funny being a, a theologian and pastor, as you watch people argue about race in America, most of them are all Gentiles. You have one Gentile not liking another Gentile for their skin color and another Gentile not liking another Gentile. And I'm thinking, you guys don't get it. And at the end of the day, even Jew or Gentile, none of that matters to God. Again, what impresses God is not your ethnicity, not what you look like, but the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And so the only way you're going to impress God is by having faith in his son. Now, look at also, there doesn't matter whether you're slave or free. Again, Marxism is built on class warfare. But God, God doesn't care. God isn't impressed if you're wealthy, and he's not impressed if you're poor. The only thing that impresses God is the work of his son. Now, notice gender doesn't matter to God. Notice he says that whether you're male or female, none of that matters. Okay, again, what impresses God is not if you're male or female, but the work of his son. And so the only thing that impresses God is that you are found in Jesus Christ, because only Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, who lived the perfect life that none of us could, impresses the father. That means race, class, gender really doesn't matter. That means at the end of the day, there are really only two races. Those who are dead sinners in Adam, who are perishing, who are under the wrath of God, who will spend eternity in the lake of fire, according to Revelation chapter 20, according to Jesus in Matthew 20, 10, 28. Yes, that's one race. And the other race is those who have fled to Jesus Christ by faith for the forgiveness of sins. Now, let's get back to racism. What I'm claiming is that the only stopgap against racism is the belief that God creates men and women, the unborn and the aged, all in his image. And so don't fool yourself into thinking that if men and women were merely cosmic accidents that we would have any worth. We would not. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk about the doctrine that I believe leads to racism. Whose doctrines lead to racism? I'm going to be claiming, ironically, they're doctrines from the left. And meanwhile, they're claiming everyone else is a racist. Now, if I were to single out one doctrine that attacks the imagio Dei, the image of God, status of every human being more than any other, it's the doctrine of macroevolution, okay, the, the, the doctrine of Darwinian evolution. Now, what I want to do is define two different types of evolution. The first type is what I call macroevolution. Now, macroevolution is synonymous with what Darwin taught. And the idea is that you have this gradual change of simple single-celled organisms into human beings by natural selection over a long period of time. Okay, and I'm just focusing on the human aspect of it. So this is the belief system that Darwin had that you go from amoeba to man, or is the old joke from goo to you by way of the zoo, all right? So this is the idea that because some single-celled organism had a mutation that was beneficial and allows it to survive better than its other single-celled organisms, it survives to pass on that mutation or that trait, and gradually over time through natural selection, you go from single-celled organisms all the way to mankind. The problem with macroevolution, which is Darwinian evolution, is really twofold. Number one, the fossil record has been a tremendous embarrassment. You simply don't have the transitional forms that should be there if it were true. The second problem is there's other theories that blow it out of the water, like irreducible complexity. Michael Behe's irreducible complexity devastates the doctrine of macroevolution. Why? Because when we look at uh, things like within our body, for example, blood clotting, Blood clotting used to be thought to be very simple until the electron microscope showed it to be very complex. It's so complex, I could spend a whole hour just describing it on a sheet. I've actually done that in a class. And so what we realized is that that couldn't come about gradually, that the system of blood clotting in a human is so re irreducibly complex, if you took any component away, it would cease to function at all. So it couldn't come about gradually. So macroevolution is completely a fraud. It's not true. It's, it's a debunked theory, in my opinion. Now, let me show you a whole different animal, no pun intended. That's microevolution. Microevolution says, yes, you have variety within a species or genus of creatures in which you have a range of different characteristics. And so, yes, within the kinds that God created, you can have variation. We have different kinds of dogs. You have some dogs that got pointy ears and some dogs that have floppy ears but they're still dogs. 
you have some human beings that have brown eyes and some have hazel eyes and some have green eyes and some have blue eyes, but they're all human beings. They're not going to evolve from that kind. Okay. Now, how consumed were the Nazis with race in Darwinian evolution? Well, very interestingly, the people of Germany were consumed with Darwinian evolution when Adolf Hitler comes to power. In fact, in Mein Kampf, Adolf Hitler has a whole chapter entitled Nation and Race, and it's the only chapter of Mein Kampf that he ends up putting out as a pamphlet. He thought it was so important. And so to Hitler, Darwinian evolution was essential to get out to the masses of the German people. In fact, listen to what he said in Mein Kampf in this chapter. And here what you're going to see is he takes issue with in interbreeding between the supposedly superior Aryan race and the Jewish people. And he explains why he doesn't want interbreeding. He says, quote, any crossing of two beings not at exactly the same level produces a medium between the level of the two parents. He goes on to say, this means the offspring will probably stand higher than the racially lower parent, but not as high as the racially higher parent. He goes on to say that the stronger must dominate and not blend with the weaker thus sacrificing his own greatness. Only the born weakling can view this as cruel, but he, after all, is only a weak and limited man. For if this law did not prevail, any conceivable higher evolution of living beings would be unthinkable." Unquote. Dear ones, in the 1920s, Adolf Hitler gave a speech that was entitled, Why We Are Anti-Semites. And in that speech, what he was doing is he was showing that the reason the Aryan race, the German people, had evolved further than the Jews and therefore should intermarry was because supposedly the Aryan race had gone through an evolutionary process in a very difficult northern climate. And therefore, they were a more robust people. So one of the issues for Hitler is he didn't want them to intermarry with Jews who would bring them down genetically. And so all of his views that is, Hitler and the Nazi party's racist views were always tainted by macroevolution. It's funny, many of you I know have seen the movie Expelled with Ben Stein. Ben Stein is a hoot in that movie if you haven't seen it. Um, and if you haven't, you should watch it. Expelled is a movie where Ben Stein goes into various campuses and really exposes how academia will not allow creationism to be taught on campus. They won't allow an honest debate between evolution and creationism. Now, Ben Stein, in one part of the movie, he goes to a museum in Germany. And in this museum, it's dedicated to those who were murdered by the Nazis because they were deemed less desirable because of some genetic flaw that they had. In fact, many of them were experimented on. Many of them had been tortured. And so at this point in the movie, Ben Stein turns to the curator of the museum, a German woman, and says, what doctrine led to the atrocities that occur here with these less desirables, according to the Nazis, in the museum? And the woman looked at him, and without blinking an eye, she said, Darwinism. Darwinism was the doctrine that led to racism and led to the murder of people that were deemed less desirable than the Aryan race. Dear ones, there are two doctrines that are always going to lead to some form of evil, especially racism, and that is atheism and pantheism. When you reject and hate the God that exists by either claiming you are God because there's no other, or by claiming somehow God is in everything, including you, it ends up leading to evil and oftentimes to racism. Evolution is the other doctrine that goes hand in hand with that. And by the way, it wasn't just Adolf Hitler who held to that, Karl Marx was a man greatly influenced by the doctrines of Darwinian evolution. In fact, uh, Karl Marx wrote his book, Das Kapital, just eight years after Darwin wrote his book, Origin of the Species. Now, I want you to think about this. When we think about which doctrine leads to racism, I want you to think about this. The average con conservative evangelical is going to believe something like this. They say God is creator. And as God as creator, they say, I believe all human beings are created in the image of God and deserve protection. Now, if they ever have a racist 
uh, action, we can at least hold them accountable and say, hey, you claim to believe this. And if someone is filled by the Spirit, they're going to repent and say, of course, that was wrong. What was I thinking? But I want you to think about who believes this? Who believes that humans are merely cosmic accidents? Well, I dare say it's the majority of the left. Those who are teaching in academic circles, in secular academia. They say, I believe humans evolved gradually over time through natural selection from single-celled organisms. They believe in going from amoeba to man, that human beings were merely cosmic accidents. And if that is so, and it is, that's what they believe, then what are the odds that one race didn't evolve further than another race? Or that maybe putting it another way, that all races evolved equally? Well, the chances of that are so remote, it's really a form of special pleading. If it's all random, it's not created, of course, one race evolved further than another. That's what leads to the doctrine of racism, and it leads to the hatred of people that don't look like you do. It's not believing that people are made in the image of God. It's believing that people evolve further than other people. In fact, many of you have heard of Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger the founder of Planned Parenthood, she was a eugenicist. She was a believer in macroevolution. In fact, she was a friend of Ernst Haeckel, the German eugenicist, very much responsible for some of the ideology of the Nazis. Now, there's been a lot of debate between conservatives and the left about whether or not Margaret Sanger was a racist. And I think we can cut the Gordian knot and say, yes, she was. Why? Because in 1926, in Silver Lake, New Jersey, Margaret Sanger gave a lecture to the women of the Ku Klux Klan, and I don't think it was to refute them, all right? Now, there's a, it's funny, I go online and I see a bunch of people on the left trying to say, oh, that's not true, it's only right-wing propaganda. The problem with it is it's in her autobiography that she wrote in 1938. Margaret Sanger said this on page 366 or 367. Sanger said, quote, always to me, an aroused group was a good group, and therefore I accepted an invitation to talk to the women's branch of the Ku Klux Klan at Silver Lake, New Jersey, one of the weirdest experiences I had in lecturing, unquote. What would you say if some conservative today, some politician, went and spoke to a Ku Klux Klan leader? Well, you would probably conclude that they must be a racist if they came not to rebuke them. Well, what do we conclude about Margaret Sanger? Now, here's what I want you to think about. Her organization, Planned Parenthood, that she founded, is responsible for murder of 19 million black babies that have been murdered because of abortion. Now, they weren't all Planned Parenthood, but the vast majority have been. In fact, there was a 2012 study which suggested that 79% of Planned Parenthood surgical abortion facilities were deliberately located within walking distance of minority communities. Why? Because Margaret Sanger believed people were merely cosmic accidents and that the white race evolved further than the black race. And so just like Adolf Hitler, she thought the black race were part of the undesirables. Now, what's so sad is if you go onto a Google search and you Google search who Margaret Sanger was, this shows you how left-wing Google is. You know how Google represents Margaret Sanger in a search? She's known as a quote-unquote American educator. That's like typing in Joseph Goebbels and finding out that he was a German educator. Dear ones, I'm not claiming that all evolutionists are racist, but what I am claiming is nearly all of the racists who have led mass movements have been evolutionists. Now, what we see in scripture very clearly is to dislike or to hate or to mistreat anyone based on an ethnic trait or their skin color is evil. It's an attack not only on the human being, but on God who creates all human beings in his image. But the only way that that means anything, my statement, is if you believe that it's indeed God is the creator of all human beings whether it's man, woman, or child, whether it's the unborn or the elderly, that they're made in his image. Okay, now what I want to do is talk about the evil of falsely accusing people of being racist when that can't be known. 
And I want to talk about something that I witnessed firsthand when I was a 20 year old. Uh, back when I was 20, I was working on my pilot's licenses. I was a private pilot. I had my instrument rating, my commercial license. I was working to be a flight instructor. But I was also working on a two year degree so I could get my four year degree. And I was at North Hennepin. And I was shocked because I was told that because I was white, I was automatically a racist. And so this was in the early 90s, it was already out there. And what was funny is I was told as I was sitting there in this class, that I was an oppressor. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange because I'm so busy working and flying, I don't have time to oppress anybody. <laughs> so it was always kind of a curious thing, but nonetheless, that was the accusation. But what I'm gonna show you today is the left claims that all white people are inherently racist. The problem with that is by the left claiming it, they're claiming to have omniscience and know the heart, which is something God alone has. And so in a real sense, when the left is claiming to be the knower of the heart, they're usurping a unique role that God alone has. That's the problem. The accusation that all white people are racist is really an attempt to usurp God alone as the knower of men's hearts. In fact, let me show you this, that God alone is the knower of the heart. We see this in Jeremiah 17, verses 9 through 10. Now, quickly, for those that may differ with us, why should we listen to Jeremiah? Well, because Jeremiah is a prophet, and he was chosen by the Holy One of Israel to speak authoritatively on his behalf. And so the very words of Jeremiah are the very words of God himself, the God of Israel. Listen to what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 17, we'll start with verse 9. He says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, at the outset, notice in verse 9, we see the doctrine of original sin. Human beings are not pristine individuals, only tainted later by society, as the left claim. And by the way, that's why they believe humans can bring about utopia. But instead, what are we? Our hearts are desperately sick. We're sinful. We're sick puppies. Um, Paul says that we're, there's none righteous, no, not one. That's exactly what Jeremiah said. Now, notice in Jeremiah 17:9, Jeremiah is talking about the heart. The Jews knew that the heart was an organ that pumped blood but they're using it in a metaphorical way, Jeremiah is. We do that all the time. We say that football team showed a lot of heart. You don't go up to the person and say, don't you know the heart is the organ that pumps blood? You know they're using it as a metaphor. So the metaphor of the heart for the Hebrew was the heart was really the center of thought life. Yes, it was the emotions, but it was more than that. It was the intellect and also the will. And so literally you could say the center of a person's thought life is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick, who can understand it? Now, by the way, in red, that, that question, who can understand it, is a rhetorical question that demands the answer, nobody. Nobody can understand except God himself, the condition of the human heart or thought life. In fact, that's what's stated now in verse 10. Notice he says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Notice mind and heart here are synonymous. He says, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Now, the importance of this for our discussion regarding falsely accusing people of being racist cannot be overestimated. The reason why is think about what Jeremiah is saying is the only one who knows the motives of the heart is God alone. And yet you have the left wholesale saying that all white people are born racist, and therefore they're claiming to be the heart knower that God alone is. Now, we see that this is an issue not just in the old covenant, but in the new covenant as well. In other words, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul himself was being judged regarding his motives by the Corinthian congregation. The Corinthian congregation was saying, well, Paul preaches to us in order to get wealthy. So they were judging his motives. But notice what Paul says. He says exactly what Jeremiah said. 1 Corinthians 4, 5, he says, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Now, dear ones, I want you to notice here that in the very beginning of verse 5, when Paul says, do not go on passing judgment, the term judgment there, crino, has to do with judging Paul to be either moral or immoral. 
as to his final state, whether he's with God or not with God. Okay, but notice Paul says we can't judge that before the time. The time refers to when the Lord comes, the day of the Lord. Why? Because they were judging Paul's motive, saying that they were impure. And what Paul is saying is they can't know that. In fact, only God, notice in the red, only God knows that which is hidden and the motives of what? The motives of men's heart. That's exactly what Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 was saying, that God alone knows the motives of the heart. All right. Now, when we look at the Bible, the Bible does tell us to judge doctrine and deed. We see that in Matthew 7. We see it in 1 Corinthians 5. So we can judge people's actions and we can judge people's deeds, but no human being can ever claim to be someone who knows the heart of man, to know what the motives of a person's inner being is. And so that's the problem with the left. When the left claims that they know every single white person is a racist, they're claiming knowledge where they can have no knowledge. They're actually claiming to usurp God, who alone is the heart knower of men and women. That's evil. Now, I want you to see that this gets even more evil when we look at the penalty of falsely accusing. One of the things that the Democrat Party has done in the left is that they're falsely accusing people of being racist when they have no knowledge of that and they can't know it because they're not the heart knower. And what's interesting is the left often does this. The left often commands people and makes laws to attack God's law. So let me give you an example. We look at the 10th commandment, the law prohibiting covetousness. You shall not covet your neighbor's possession. Well, the whole point of the left-wing party is to say, hey, you don't deserve that. We're gonna take it from that guy and we're gonna give it to this guy. And so they're forcing covetousness at the point of a gun, that we're going to use our tax policy to say that guy didn't deserve it, we're going to give something else. That's legislated covetousness. But it's not just an attack on the 10th commandment, they're attacking the 9th commandment and commanding people to disobey it, and they're doing it themselves. The 9th commandment says, thou shalt not bear false testimony. Well, how much greater false testimony could you bear against your neighbor other than saying, well, if you're white, you're a racist? something that they can't know, something that they're usurping God alone as the heart knower for. Okay, now I want to turn to Deuteronomy 19 because this is something our social justice warriors I don't think are taking into account because in Deuteronomy 19, God lays out what he requires for evidence to bring against a human being made in the image of God if you're going to convict them. And in Deuteronomy 19, 15, God says, if you're going to bring an allegation, you have to have two or three witnesses. So that by two or three witnesses, every fact will be established to protect human beings made in the image of God. And in fact, Jesus takes that in Matthew 18, and he uses it for the church discipline issue. Okay, now, when you get to Deuteronomy 19, 18 through 19, notice what Moses writes. He says, the judges shall investigate thoroughly. And if the witnesses, if, excuse me, if the witness is a false witness, and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. Now, dear ones, what I want you to notice here is that if you falsely accuse someone of doing something, what does God call it? Notice on the screen, it's evil. It's evil. Now, again, the left is claiming that all white people are racist, something they can't know. They're not the heart knower. What are they doing? Well, they're doing something that's evil. Now, the people who claim to know social justice, what I'm claiming is they're really doing an injustice. And notice, in fact, in red, God says that whatever you claim they did, you're guilty of it. In other words, if you claim falsely that someone's a murderer and you have no evidence for it, you're the murderer in God's eyes. If you claim someone's the thief and you have no evidence for it, you're the thief. Now, let's extend that logically. If you claim someone's a racist and you have no evidence for it, God regards you as the racist. And so you see all these social justice warriors, what they're actually teaching is social injustice. And that's why if you're part of a social justice church, I would flee that because they don't know justice. What they know is injustice. They're the ones who are doing Isaiah 520. 
They're calling evil good and good evil. It's wicked what they're doing. All right, flee from it. Now, let me show you under the new covenant, there's even a stronger penalty under the new covenant for those who slander and falsely accuse people. Notice what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Paul is going to give a list of sins that will take you out of the kingdom of God and land you square under the wrath of God. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, for the sake of time, I want to focus on revilers. The term in Greek there is actually loiteros. And loiteros literally is the one who slanders. Now, how do you slander a person? Well, one way of doing it is by falsely accusing them. And what else can we call the allegation that all white people are guilty of racism when the left can't know the heart of anybody? Well, of course that's slander. And therefore, they're the loiteros, they're the reviler, and therefore what? They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Now, the good news is that God forgives sins. In fact, we see that in the next verse. God is good and he's gracious. And if you repent and you come to faith in Jesus Christ, he'll forgive you for all of your sins. Jesus Christ paid for it all. But do not fool yourself. You on the left and you, think, you who think that you're part of the social justice movement, that by claiming that you know the heart of all people and that they're all racist, that you're somehow doing good. You're doing grave evil in the eyes of the Holy One of Israel. And you need to know that. You need to be rebuked and you need to repent. You need to come to faith in Jesus Christ. That's what you need. Otherwise, you will answer for these sins before Jesus Christ himself. All right, now, what I wanna do is I wanna move on to talk about why this is going on. The ultimate reason why the left is accusing a whole group of people of being racist simply because they're born white, is because the most powerful position in the planet is to be the lawgiver. We see this temptation given to Adam and Eve by Satan in the garden. Remember in Genesis 3, 5, the serpent tempts Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. Satan says, hey, did God say that you'll really die? You're not going to die if you eat the forbidden fruit. You're going to, what, be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. So the original temptation in the garden that Adam and Eve succumbed to was the temptation to be the lawgiver and determine what is right and what is wrong for themselves. Now, thankfully, God has provided us with lawgivers. The first lawgiver that he gave us was Moses. Moses was the prophet of God who spoke uniquely for him as unto a friend. They spoke. Moses was face to face with God. Now, no one can see God as he is and lives, but it was a mediated uh, theophany. But nonetheless, no one had experiences up until that time like Moses did. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. And ironically, it's the Mosaic law that really undergirds the law of Western civilization. And so as the left, for example, forbids prayer in school or forbids Christianity from being taught in schools, Really, that was designed to get rid of Moses and get rid of the law-giving nature of the biblical worldview on the culture of America. Now, Moses himself predicted his own, his own successor, somebody who would come after him that would be the eternal lawgiver. And Moses predicts that in Deuteronomy 18.15, that God would raise up a prophet from among Israel and if the Israelis wouldn't listen to him, it would be required of them. In fact, if anyone wouldn't listen to him, it would be required of them by God. That's in Deuteronomy 18.15. Well, when you go to the New Testament, Jesus is the new lawgiver. In fact, in Matthew 17, remember, there's the voice from heaven during Jesus' glorification as he's transfigured before his disciples. And remember, who's on the mountain with them? Moses and Elijah. Why? Because every fact is going to be established by two or three witnesses, Deuteronomy 19.15. So Moses represents the law, Elijah the prophets. And so they're bearing witness that Jesus Christ is who he claims to be. But remember, before Peter speaks and says, hey, we should maybe make a tabernacle for all three, all of a sudden there's only one left, and it's Jesus. Moses and Elijah are gone. 
a voice from heaven comes down and says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And who was that him? It was Jesus. Jesus, the mediator and the lawgiver of the eternal covenant. And so today, Jesus and his apostles determine what is right and what is wrong, what is moral and what is immoral. And so trying to usurp Jesus is a very wicked thing indeed. Now, what we see in the scriptures is that one day there's going to be a false lawgiver that comes on the scene of history, and that's the Antichrist. We see it in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, Revelation 13, Matthew 24. It's all over the place. And so the Antichrist is going to usurp Christ for a short period of time as the lawgiver. That's one of the major roles. He sets himself up as God and the lawgiver of all. Now, why is that important? Well, I want you to think about what the left is really doing is they're attempting to be the new lawgiver. And as they do that, as, as they come up with their own morality that is apart from what Jesus and his apostles reveal, they're really lining up with the Antichrist. In fact, John says this, by the way, there's not just one Antichrist. There's been many Antichrists, and there's a spirit of Antichrist in the world today. In fact, John said it this way, 1 John 2.18, he says, children, this is the last hour, and just as you heard, the Antichrist is coming, and even now many Antichrists have appeared, and this is how we know it's the last hour. So the left is lining up with the spirit of Antichrist by becoming the new lawgiver. Let me ask you the question. Let's look at the screen. Did Jesus ever say that you were evil if you're born white? No. Did Jesus ever say you're evil, for that matter, for being born a Jew or being born black or being born brown? No. So anyone who claims that is what? They're a false lawgiver. If someone says to you that they don't like you because you're black or they don't like you because you're white, it's lining up with Antichrist because Jesus doesn't say that's immoral. That's just the way he created you. And so one of the problems that we see today with the left is that their definition of sin, and I use sin in quotes, is imagine they wouldn't use the term sin, but they would use the moral category probably of evil. So I want you to think about their definition of sin being imagined, meaning it's not revealed by Jesus. It's not revealed by his apostles. It's made up in their head. So for example, one example is they believe it's sinful to burn carbon dioxide. The problem with that, of course, is every time you breathe, you burn carbon dioxide. Okay, that sin is imagined. It's not revealed. Jesus doesn't say you can't burn carbon dioxide. They think it's a sin if you're born white. Where does Jesus say it's a sin being born white? He doesn't. The sin is imagined in their mind. It's not true evil. And so the third problem with it is there's no repentance possible. Let me ask the question, how in the world can you ever repent of being born white? How could you ever repent of it? How could you ever repent, by the way, of, of committing uh, emission of CO2? You can't. You can't stop breathing. So the guilt that they lay upon people is much like the Pharisees did. Jesus said, you Pharisees, you brood of vipers, you're really good at heaping guilt on everyone, but you won't lift it with one finger. You see, the left is telling people that because you're born white, you're doing evil. After all, you're a racist. Can you think of anything more evil than that? But how do you turn from that? Repentance implies that you're able to turn and to change. How can you turn from being white? You can't. And so the only option left to you is to, to vote for their woke candidate and give them political power. And that's the penance and form of atonement that they leave you. Dear ones, this is evil. The social justice warriors of the left are really attempting to overthrow Christ as the lawgiver. And the question before us is, are we going to tolerate it? I'm not. And I don't think anyone else should either. Do not tolerate false lawgivers, whoever they are and whatever they claim. If they claim something different than Jesus, we say nuts to you. Go pound sand. And the irony to me, the sad, bitter irony is the very party of racism that founded racism is trying to claim now that everyone else is guilty of it. Let me give you a brief history. I have researched this exhaustively. So let me do a little history with you to talk about who's really responsible for racism. The Democrat Party was founded in 1828. 
In the year 1854, the Republican Party was founded as the anti-slavery party. And the reason the Republican Party was founded is because slavery was really endemic to the Democrat Party. It was part and parcel to it. Not so says Eric Dalma, so says Carol Swain, African-American professor from Vanderbilt University. And she would affirm, yes, it was the Republican Party that was created to be the anti-slavery party in 1854. The year 1857, a very important land cart, landmark Supreme Court decision came down. Many of you have heard of it. It was the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a slave. A man named Sanford, I don't know what his first name was, he was the owner. And Dred Scott was brought by his owner from Missouri, which is a slave state. He was brought to Illinois, and then later to the Wisconsin territories, which were free. And Dred Scott's argument was an astute one. He said, look, I'm in a free area of the country. I should be free. Well, in a 7-2 decision, the Supreme Court said, no, you're not a human being. You're merely the property of Sanford. The seven justices that said he was merely property, they were all Democrats. The two men that said, no, you're a human being made in the image of God who deserved protection under the Constitution were both Republican. By the year 1860, not one Republican owned one slave in all of America. By 1861, the Civil War breaks out. From 1861 to 1865, you have over 300,000 white men from the Republican Party that try to prevent the Democrats from enslaving forever Black people in our nation. In fact, what we've often heard is that the battle was primarily a North and South one, but in reality, the, the battle in the Civil War was a Democrat versus Republican battle. That's what the battle really was. We're, we've been duped. Why do I say that? Because Lincoln himself said, of the four Democrats most responsible for the Civil War, three of them were from the North. James Buchanan, Franklin Pierce, and Stephen Douglas. Three of the four worst Democrats that led to slavery and led to the Civil War were Northern Democrats. They weren't from the South. Now, you might say to yourself, well, if we fast forward to now, certainly the Democrat Party isn't a racist party. Oh yeah? In 2014, guess who got the Margaret Sanger Award? Yes, the Margaret Sanger who spoke at the Ku Klux Klan meeting in 1926. Yes, the Margaret Sanger who wanted to exterminate the black race. Yes, the Margaret Sanger who gave us Planned Parenthood that murdered millions of black babies in the womb. That Margaret Sanger, who got a reward? Was it some conservative? Was it some uh, Republican senator? Was it Donald Trump? No, it was Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi got the Margaret Sanger Award. Why? Because the Democrat Party was the party of racism. And what's especially galling to me, and especially irksome, is I don't know if you've noticed it lately, but the Democrats have been rioting, the Democrat constituency have been looting, and what they're really doing is they're trying to obfuscate the truth. They're trying to confuse everything by saying, hey, let's blame America, or let's blame the founders, or let's blame all white people, or let's blame Republicans, when you're the ones who did it. The Democrats are the ones who did it. You're ones Think about this analogy. I want you to think about this. Think about if you went to Germany right now and you go to Germany and let's just say hypothetically the Nazi party was still in existence, just hypothetically. And you see a bunch of Nazis standing around a Wehrmacht soldier statue and they're tearing it down, a German soldier from World War II. And as they're tearing it down, you go up to one of the Nazis who belonged to the Nazi party and you say, hey, why are you te tearing down the German soldier. And they say because of the evil he perpetrated in the Holocaust, the Holocaust murdered Jews. Wouldn't it dawn on you to say to the individual, hey, buddy, it wasn't the German soldier apart from your party that did it. Your party did it. It was the Nazi party that was responsible. That's what was going on in the rioting. The people belonging to the party that did it we're trying to claim that others did it. And I, for one, don't wanna stand by and let them get away with it. No, the truth is important. The truth has to come out. The Democrats did it. The irony is I want you to look on the statue, the picture of the statue that you see on the screen. The man's name there 
is Hans Christian Hegg. And what's interesting is on June 23rd of 2020, the woke crowd of the racist Democrat Party, they tore him down. And they beheaded the statue. Why? Because he was a white man. But you know who Hans Christian Hegg really was? He was an abolitionist. In fact, he came to the United States as an immigrant himself in 1840. In 1859, he started a group called the Wisconsin Wide Awakes. Yes, let me say that again, the Wisconsin Wide Awakes. And the whole point of the organization, it was a paramilitary organization fighting against the Democrats and against slavery. This guy was woke when it really meant something. This guy was woke when it, he actually had to fight against slavery in systemic racism. In fact, he took a bullet from a Democrat on September 19th, 1863, and he died to slave black men and women who were made in the image of God. But the woke crowd beheaded him and tore down his statue merely because he was white. And those are the people who are crying social justice. Well, I tell you what, I'm not impressed. And I, in fact, I'll just say it, it's disgustingly evil. And so I wanna leave you with three points. First point, for those that may not agree with me, who may be watching this, I wanna challenge you. If you're part of the social justice movement, whether it's in a church or whether it's part of some other ideological political movement, I challenge you to leave it. They're telling you a bunch of nonsense. What they're teaching you isn't justice, it's injustice, and you will be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. Your knee will bow and your tongue confess that he is Lord. You better repent now. The second thing I would say is that the only stopgap against true racism, doctrinally, is believing that God creates men and women in his image. Don't fool yourself into thinking that all well, some races, all the races evolved, and they all happen to evolve equally. It's not plausible. It's a form of special pleading. The third thing I'd like to leave you with, and this is for every single person out there, even though I'm hot under the collar, even though I'm lathered up, I love you. And we at Gospel of Grace Fellowship, we wanna see the best for you. And one of the reasons I wanna see the best for you is because I know just about every way possible, I've been a sinner in my own life. I'm just another beggar who's found the bread of life. What you need to have your heart's heart cleansed from sin is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only through the gospel that the human heart that's desperately wicked and deceitful above all things can be healed. The reason why everyone needs the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, because we all have sinned against God in thought, word, and deed. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, the bad news gets worse when you consider the fact that the wages of our sin is death, not just temporary death, but one day eternal separation from God in the lake of fire, so says Jesus. If you don't like it, take it up with Jesus. He says it in Matthew 10, 28. He says it in Matthew 25. His apostle speaks of it in Revelation chapter 20. It's true. I can't think of any worse news. That we're sinners, we've rebelled against God, we deserve his wrath forever. But that's where the good news of the gospel shines. The gospel means good news. But if you don't understand the bad news, the good news makes no sense. You see, the good news is that God planned before the foundation of the world to send forth his son. The son who existed as God and with God from all eternity at a point in history humbled himself and he became a man. And he lived the perfect life that no one could. He was the one who had never had a racist thought. He was the one who never had a wicked thought in his heart. And so by faith in him, his righteousness can be clothed upon our account. He is the one who did that for us. But Jesus didn't just live the perfect life. He also died a substitutionary death so that he would take the wrath of God for us. As it says, Jesus died the just on behalf of us, the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. Proof that Jesus did that for us was seen by the fact that on the third day after his death, he was bodily raised from the dead. In fact, he was seen by over 500 witnesses at one time, according to 1 Corinthians 15. This Jesus resurrection proves all of his claims. When Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, we can believe it. Why? Because he was raised from the dead. Jesus bodily is set into the heavens where he's seated at the right hand of God in heaven from where he's coming again to bring a glorious kingdom for his people, but wrath and judgment upon his enemies. 
What does Jesus require? He commands every single person. Remember, he's the lawgiver. Mark 1.15, Jesus commands everyone to repent and to believe the gospel. Repent has to do with turning from idolatry. Maybe you're a socialist or a Marxist. You're following Karl Marx. Leave that today. Turn from that and turn to Christ. Maybe you're an atheist and you believe in Darwinian evolution. Turn from that and turn to God on his terms, which is what? Faith alone in Christ alone. That Jesus Christ alone is your salvation, that he did it all for you, that he really was bodily raised from the dead. And if you will trust upon him, the good news of scripture is that all of your sins can be forgiven. And you have the hope of a glorious kingdom. One that will come about not as the result of taking from the haves and giving to the have-nots under Marxism, but a true kingdom that only the Lord Jesus Christ can bring. Today is the day to repent, trust in him for the forgiveness of sin, leaving behind all sin, including even racism. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it cuts and it rebukes us where we need it, that it strengthens and it edifies it, edifies us when we need it. We do thank you that you give us a straight path so that we can have forgiveness of sins, whatever sins we may have committed. I do pray, Heavenly Father, if there's anyone listening to this, if they're in the social justice movement, if they're followers of Karl Marx, if they're doing these types of evil things, that they would be cut to the heart, Lord, for their own good, for their own eternal sake, that they would not spend an eternity under your wrath. I do pray, Lord, that you would reach them, that they would turn by faith to your son. I do thank you for my dear brothers and sisters at Gospel of Grace Fellowship. I pray for their stamina. I pray, Lord, that you would enable them to persevere and to be salt and light in a post-Christian and decaying culture. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless all of you at Gospel of Grace. I hope you have a wonderful Sunday and a wonderful week. I'll give you the benediction here out of Jude 24 and 25, so you can please stand for the benediction. I'll give you a chance to stretch your legs. Jude 24 and 25 it says this it says now to him who was able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to god our savior who alone is wise be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and forever amen god bless you have a wonderful week